Okay, and we're back. Uh, welcome to Keep High Pie Happy Hour uh, Fridays. And tonight's guest speaker is Liz Gordon of Loft at Liz's. And she is going to discuss um, a current exhibition, uh, Skin Deep. And I think there's some of the artists that are in the exhibit are here tonight. She'll go ahead and introduce them. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Betty Ann Brown for her assistance tonight. And uh, here we go. And definitely, Betty, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I would like uh, for the artists who are in the show, Miles, can you wave so everybody knows who you are? Miles Regis. Hey and um, we're going to be talking about everybody's work. Um, and then at the end, we're, we're hoping to have a Q&A. And so uh, keep those questions in, uh, in mind and, and so on uh, as uh, we go through the PowerPoint. Um, uh, Richard Turner, are you there? Yes. Hello. I'm here. Richard. OK. And uh, there's Monique. Monique. Uh, here I am. Which, oh, which there you are. OK. She's with me in the gallery. And uh, Monique is involved to be actually be the um, co-curator with me. We're working on another project we'll tell you about on Tuesday uh, in regard to another panel discussion that we will be doing. Um, and uh, she's also in the show. And- um, Is oh, that you with the coupe? Rifle. Yes. Take her away. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, I ask yeah. everyone to please mute yourself too. Thank and you. Then, and then um, Jackie Nash. Jackie. Um, Hi. Hello, Liz. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Jackie. Hi, dear. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. All right. So I think that may be all the attendees. Is there another artist um, uh, in the show that I have not recognized somehow or seen? Um, yeah, I'm here. It's Ted. Oh, oh there's Ted. OK. Hi, I'm Ted. Here. Hi, Ted. Ted Meyer. And um, also, I want to. Uh, say hello to Carla Viparelli. Carla, can you wave? Okay. Carla um, is, has been added in the show um, and I'll talk about that towards the end. Okay. And it's called in from Italy. Yes. Right. From Naples. Yeah. So we're thrilled to have you all. And who knows, maybe a couple of other people may jump in depending on um, whether they can make it or not during this hour. So um, that said, everybody mute. And Jackie, you want to mute? I, I see yeah. your uh, audio is still on. So you want to mm. go mm. ahead on the bottom left corner. Bottom okay. left, stop the, yeah, there you go. Okay, the mute, yeah, there you go. And anybody else? And, um, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and start the PowerPoint um, as soon as Betty does that. I, I want to um, talk a bit, this, the name of the show is Skin Deep, Then and Now. So we did this show 10 years ago. Um, so this particular show serves as uh, both a retrospective as well as a contemporary exhibition. And so there are some works in the show, everybody was asked to put in uh, a piece from the original show, but some of the people's works got sold, some of it got lost, it's been 10 years and so on. Um, and so there are, some of the artists have some of the original works and then um, some of the artists do not. And I'll, when, as I go through, I'll talk about what that is and who that is. And then uh, they were asked if possible to also um, create a, a a new piece for the show, which in some cases that happened and in some cases it didn't. But the point is, is that we're having this conversation. And when I first thought of doing this show 10 years ago, um, the reason was is because it was a conversation. Uh, basically it, it deals with race relations between blacks and whites and um, in the United States. And um, I, I did that because unbeknownst to me, it didn't seem like there was conversation going on anywhere about this. And this is really a pretty big issue uh, as far as I was concerned. Um, I, and something that's always been pretty prevalent in my mind 
Um, I grew up in Chicago on the South side. Um, you know, I'm right at that age where we were all exposed to the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, it was really, uh, it really formulated a lot of my beliefs and, and, um, and my feeling that, that um, racism is definitely an issue, but equality is something that we really need to strive for. And, um, and Black America has always been treated in a really horrible way and we needed to have the conversation. And so <clears throat> I thought we should do this show. And so uh, we did. And um, and it was a pretty successful show, actually. And uh, we, we had an artist talk where 80 people showed up. I mean, it was it was really amazing. Unbeknownst to me, however, this was not an issue of it being a conversation, uh, not a non-existent conversation. It was a conversation that existed in the black community. Where it didn't exist was in the white community, in the white mainstream. And so. Um, uh, that has now, of course, become uh, one of the most important factors of, um, of what is going on today. So my friend Monique, who's in the show, said to me a few months ago, uh, you know, this is, uh, we're going on our 10 year anniversary. And uh, why don't you think about bringing the show back? So she was the catalyst for this happening. And I said, that's a great idea. The conversation is definitely a different one especially because we were, you know, we've now all been exposed and BLM has become pretty powerful and, and so on. So hence, here we are. Um, we've got uh, skin deep then and now. And so all of the artists that are in the show are the same artists um, that we're in. And uh, Carla has been added and you'll see why at the end. So um, with that, uh, can you move on, Betty? Betty, thank you for... Um, that's next, I think, if she's, you are muting Betty's screen. Okay, so. so I, I've got it up. Do you want me, I've got the title slide. Do you want me to go to the next slide? Please. So that's Monique and that's me. <laughs> and, um, we were uh, at Andy, uh, Andy Moses' show at William Turner's a couple of weeks ago and thought to include this, this slide of the two of us. So, and serendipitously, we match his painting and we're both wearing red. So, so that's how that happened. Next. And this was my curator's statement. Uh, Skin Deep addresses relations between blacks and whites through the visual arts assemblage. There is assemblage in the show. There's oil, acrylic, illustration. Uh, there's jewelry and mixed media. And they all powerfully express white privilege, terror, protest, survival, hope, and motherhood. So we, we, can't, we have a balance going here. This, there's some really horrifying things to uh, see in this show and to discuss. And then there's some really hopeful, uh, there's, there's a lot of hope as well. So it's not all negative. Um, we are, uh, you've been introduced to Monique and Ted and Jackie and Miles and Richard Turner. I was thinking that Francesca was coming, but maybe not. Um, and sorry, Carla, you were not listed here because you're not one of the originals and you're um, a wonderful last minute addition. Um, Garth Trinidad is probably on KCRW at the moment, so he, he couldn't be here. I believe Zeal Harris is on her way back from Cartagena, and so she couldn't be joining us either. So um, as I said, the white uh, community, the white mainstream community did not, uh, did not have any reason to address this issue until very, very recently when there now is no way you can avoid it. The races, uh, the differences and inequalities of our races can no longer be ignored. Next. So this is a panorama of the gallery and the way that the show is laid out. Um, all the way to the left, which we'll be talking about first, is Miles work and then the second piece. So each artist pretty much has two pieces in the show uh, with, with uh, one exception. Um, and then off in the corner, for those of you who've been in the gallery and know what, how it's laid out, 
Um, that is Zeal Harris. And then you can't see Ted's pieces uh, because his is in the alcove and also he's on the small walls, but you'll be able to see his pieces in a few minutes um, when we get to his work. And then the entrance into the projects room is uh, somewhat of a church-like scenario and where uh, Francesca Schifrin's work is, uh, is showing. And then Richard Turner, Jackie Nash, and then if you could go to the next slide, Betty. Up, oh, up, oh, that one. I don't know how that one got in there. That's the last one. Um, I was hoping we'd be in the kitchen. Okay, well, I guess that one. I'll show you the kitchen in a, in a little while. Okay, so this is the uh, first um, slide that we're showing and the two pieces are next to one another. The I Am So Jealous piece was the original piece that uh, Miles had in the show. And I'm just gonna give you a little background on that piece. It was, it really um, hit home when I first saw it, when I went on a studio visit, where he explained to me how he came to do this piece, which is he was sitting in his car and it was about 11 o'clock at night and, um, He's looking in his rear view mirror where he is being um, followed by police. Um, and then he's at a stop sign or stop light. And he sees this band of um, 40 something skateboarders, white guys um, going past him, 30 or 40. You know, they weren't like young kids, but it was about 11 o'clock at night. And so he's looking in his rear view mirror in a panic, state of panic that you know they're checking out his plates and making sure he knows his registration's okay and everything's all right but he's in his car basically in a state of paranoia and so he's thinking as he's um as he is um in his car like how jealous he was that he couldn't really do what those guys were doing and um, he is actually originally from Trinidad. So it's not as if he hadn't experienced that sort of freedom and, and liberation. He had. He uh, didn't move to the United States until he was 21 years old. So he didn't have that sort of fear factor um, and that inequality inbred in him as he was growing up. Um, it was only until he became here. He, he came here that um, he he experienced that. Um, and then of course, there's the white guy who, you know, there's of course this uh, idea that all black men are uh, very, very well endowed and therefore white men are jealous of black men because of their sexual prowess and so on, which of course is, you know, an exaggeration and, ge and generalization, but this is the reality of why both uh, black and white are jealous of one another. Um, and, and so that was the piece from 10 years ago and the piece that he did for this show, or I should say, um, in this time period, this, this, uh, the period of now are the nine most prevalent people we have heard. Um, and I, uh, in regard to those who have lost their lives, the heroes who have, um, lost their lives through, uh, in, in this case, all uh, police shootings. Um, and uh, in this case, he's got nine of those people, but there's been quite, quite a bit more um, throughout the year of 2020 and of course years prior and so on. I think, I think there may even be, I hopefully there isn't nine already through this year, but um, so that that is um, Miles' work, and and it's pretty profound, and and um, I think really is a telling story for this particular show. Um, we can go next to Zeal Harris. Um, Zeal, this I'm sorry, but it's a little difficult to see that very long piece. It's approximately. Um, 10 feet or a little bit longer. Um, her work is very, very colorful, very illustrative. It can be um, a little bit deceiving because it looks so playful and, and comical, but you know, the closer you look, 
uh, at the work, you know that there's um, all sorts of uh, messages and truths and so on and so forth. Um, I will tell you that neither one of these pieces were in the original show. Uh, she went back through her work and um, and decided, I, let me just say that I believe all of her work was sold. And so she didn't have any of it that was in the previous show. Um, and so she decided because of the time period to uh, bring in this long piece. It's called Ascension and it was done in 2010, which is a, a, approximately the time that of course we were doing this show, but this one was not included. And basically it, it's a timeline. It starts with uh, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky to uh, Chelsea and Hillary and the Bush administration to finally the daughters of, um, of Ob uh, um, Obama and Michelle, uh, Barack Obama and Michelle jumping on their beds in the White House to the inauguration evening and how they were dressed um, and, and that you know, shining, uh, you know, evening and, and uh, the miracle of them being uh, in the White House and how much our country had really turned around and how, um, how hopeful everybody was in regard to how, you know, I mean, the miracle of having a black man in the White House is just like, wow, fantastic. So that was Ascension. Now, the Panthenon of Akatis Runaways is a, uh, a study, a fantasy and a study of many, many readings. And she has been reading about uh, African di uh, diaspora for, for the last three or four years. And she has a, a very large series of about 20 pieces that encompass what are called the Maroons. And these people were people who uh, actually found a way to run away, um, whether it be in the Caribbean or the United States or wherever, where they would actually find a way to go live apart from the, the slave economy. And so this one is a fantasy of, um, and, and then she incorporates fantasy where oh, this is a community of women and, um, and how they now control um, and their, their, um, their motherhood and so on. It's a world of women. And so she incorporates the myths and, um, and, and so on to create this series of work. Mm -hmm. And it is called the Pantheon of Akatis Runaways. Um, and it's much more in depth. I am going to suggest that for uh, anybody who wants to know more in depth about any of these works, we um, have a link to a YouTube of the artist talk that happened in uh, November. And so, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to send you more information about it. But she talks extensively about um, this series and about her studies in this regard, in, um, in this series. Um, and by the way, this is a, a, a mixed media on a fiberless paper. So again, her work is, is very colorful and very illustrative, but there's a, really a lot going on behind it. Um, next. Oh, this is a uh, uh, this is Zeal, and um, and one of her pieces. But again, this one was uh, this one is is now gone and not was not in the show. So next, so now we have Ted Meyer's work, and um, <coughs> Ted has these two pieces. Adam and Eve is original to the show. Um, the the idea being uh, that. He, he too was raised in the same um, type of integrated community, similar to me, um, certainly had a, um, a, a, a very open mind in terms of 
uh, mixed uh, relations and so on, and basically felt that if we would have started with Adam and Eve being an integrated couple and having children, um, then we probably would not have had any issue. Of course, then we would not have the uh, fascinating cultures that we have um, in, in all the cultures if everybody would have been all mixed up already. So, um, but uh, this is an inner, the idea being that Adam and Eve were an interracial couple. And, um, and also that, you know, there were, in, in our time as we were growing up in the 60s, I mean, a lot of our parents were, um, parents and grandparents had racist uh, sentiment. You know, maybe they weren't very vocal about it, but you know, you still kept to your own and so on and so forth. That's until, um, and this is according to Ted, and, and until they have grandchildren. And, and, um, and then they fall in love with their grandchildren and it just doesn't matter what color they are. It's their blood and their family and they accept and, um, and, and so this was his idea of that particular show uh, when we did it 10 years ago, Adam and Eve. In the meantime, uh, you know, 10 years, fast forward, um, he felt very, very uncomfortable about like taking to actually be doing art. And what really struck him um, uh, was what he kept reading about in regard to white privilege. And this is something that um, there are still a lot of people that do not recognize. I think that this piece called White Nuggets, which are nine small panels, each one with this text, which is pretty intense. Um, each one of them, I'm sure as you're reading them, um, is you know, what white privilege is really all about. We don't have to deal with any of that. We don't have to deal with the stress. We don't have to deal with walking out our doors and being worried about being shot. We don't have to worry about uh, somebody following us around in a store. Um, we don't have to think about uh, um, uh, why uh, white people are the way white people are um, and, and so on. And so I really think that this, one, this piece really hits home and sends a very, very um, strong message and um, and hopefully, for those who are not aware of white privilege, they um, they become aware of it because this is really uh, really important. Uh, I think uh, to acknowledge and becomes part of the healing process because we all we you know it's not only about that; it's also realizing. Um, that the, the issue is really a white issue. It's not a black issue. It's us that has to make the changes, whether it's with um, um, the, in, the um, institutional racism and so on and so forth. So I think Ted's piece really, really uh, confronts this and, and um, it, hopefully some of you feel the same way and, and uh, appreciate the sentiment because it's really powerful. Uh, and that takes us to next, which also is a very, very um, intense, um, this is uh, very, very intense it's by Francesca Schiffer. And she has been doing work uh, for many, many years about systemic racism um, and uh, the, the piece on the left uh, is called Paid by Cotton Death, and these are done on old journals. N neither one of these pieces were actually in the previous show. She did have a piece that was done on ledgers, uh, ledger paper, um, it, 10 years ago. And um, that ledger paper is actually, if I'm not mistaken, I believe is um, from a plantation. Uh, that she may have gotten in Haiti. Um, she um, 
So anyway, so she's done quite a series of work regarding that. And um, that piece was actually sold at the show when we did it 10 years ago, the other one that she, she had had in the show. Now, Finding Death is, um, it is about the fear tactics and the terror when people are left having been killed on the street. Um, she's, she really says, you know, that intersection of white supremacy and the creation of systematic racism. Um, I mean, she really thought that, that this kind of terror was in other countries. It wasn't in the United States. And what she's really finding is, is that this terror tactic is not only uh, from foreign powers, but um, it's, it, it has, of course, existed in this country with the lynching days and, and um, the terror tactics that that created. And, and, um, and um, she now realizes that, uh, you know, on a regular basis, this is um, violent terror and, um, and hopefully, as we continue to have conversation, uh, we will hopefully with art and words get beyond it. Um, the the um, painting, Finding Death, is an oil on canvas and it's 70 inches high by 50 inches wide. So it is in the back of the um, projects room. Can we go to the next slide, uh, Betty? So this is the entrance to the project room. And um, basically I did an installation with nine chairs inside and this is the entrance to it, which gives you the feeling of it being, you know, entering into a church. Uh, the piece above is done by a gentleman by the name of Steve Olson. Uh, not at all for this piece, but I, I had uh, acquired this piece and thought it was pretty appropriate for the top of the projects room. Uh, next. So this is the, the uh, installation of the nine chairs. And there you have finding death. So I set it up like as if somebody was actually going to a funeral. And um, the reason that we have Miles piece on the left and Ted's on the right is because both have chosen nine now um, miles did this the the nine most um most known people who have been uh shot and killed and then ted did nine of these panels uh and that was a real serendipitous thing because he didn't even realize that um that was the case and so um i i set up nine chairs and um and so this is the installation that i created to I, I think, you know, even bring a, a deeper meaning to her piece is in, and she certainly felt that way. Um, I thought she was gonna be here tonight. Maybe she will join in. So um, as, as it's been written on the top, number nine runs through the exhibition symbolizing the nine deaths that inspired the Black Lives Matter movement. And thank you, Betty, for writing that because that is the case. Um, we're gonna move on to Richard Turner's work. Um, so, uh, there's, there's some, uh, real positives in this one, believe it or not. Um, play now is the piece that was in the original show 10 years ago. He, um, was a landlord in South central and, um, saw these pieces, these kinds of signs that were hanging up in his, uh, in the neighborhood. And um, this is, by the way, an acrylic on canvas. And this is quite large. It's 40 by 60. Um, and so, you know, the bankruptcy, the divorce, the eviction, uh, getting paid and so on and so forth. This is all um, the kind of signage that was throughout the neighborhood. The kid with his eyes over his, uh, over his, uh, I mean, his hand over his eyes is about bling and how that's about to fall and the choices that people have to make uh, when confronted with, you know, wealth and, and, uh, and the opportunity to make wealth uh, and the bling bling and the getting um, 
the, the importance of being very, very well dressed and so on and so forth. And then the malt liquor uh, down below signifies the, um, the, de the degeneration that, that, you know, or, or how you can fall into the abyss of uh, the malt and, um, and how it can take over the lives. And um, the play now it is now is then the race card. Um, and how with all of this that having to be confronted with um, all of the, uh, the visuals in those areas and, and how that plays out in the lives of the people that are there. The, peop the, the, the piece on the right, which is a very, very, very different medium, uh, it's an assemblage piece which uh, Richard is, uh, uh, does a variety of different kinds of works. He's an amazing painter. When he comes back on, you'll see this amazing painter, paint, uh, painting that he has behind him. I actually own one of those in red, you'll see. Um, uh, this is an assemblage piece. All of the pieces have been collected from the street. Uh, but what it's called is the veneration of the black matriarch in urban mythology. And what it really is, is a tribute to the black woman who basically raised kids in neighborhoods uh, throughout the world who may have lost their families. There was always this one woman who would literally sacrifice her life for the kids in the neighborhood. And um, they ended up being raised by her, whether they lost their parents or their parents were whatever, you know, who knows, maybe even working full time, um, she became the matriarch of the um, neighborhood and the kids could depend on her. And so this really is about, uh, it's a reliquy uh, and, and made of found objects and it helps, it depicts the uh, black woman as a demigod. She is the ancestor, the first mother, the healer, the nurturer, the defender, the warrior, the oracle, and the wellspring of perseverance. And um, she does it you know, without any expectation. She just offers her life to them. And he felt that um, this is that that he really wanted to give this black matriarch, this black woman, the tribute that it deserves. And if I'm not mistaken, it is a series and um, I, I'm not sure how many pieces he's done. We can ask him that. I, I know for sure there's two. I'm not quite sure if there's more, but it's, it's a, um, a very beautiful assemblage that um, really salutes uh, the the aunt and mother and uh, in in the black community. Next, this is Jackie Nash's uh, two pieces, and these two pieces too were not in the original show. But basically, um, I, I think all of her pieces are gone and sold. Um, she had some wonderful pieces, but uh, she went through her archives and brought in the Venda mother and child and the sound of the Venda drummer. Now the Venda is, an, uh, she is, uh, Jackie Nash is from South Africa. And um, this is a tribe in the north of, um, it's a, a, the Venda people of the northern part of South Africa. And um, she uh, chose these two piece, pieces really uh, to, to talk about the, the, the differences in our cultures, but yet similarities in our cultures about mother and child. And also this was, she's from South Africa where of course she is, you know, the land of apartheid. So they too have had their incredible racial issues. Um, Jackie herself, her family immigrated there from Europe um, during the Holocaust and, and 
or, or I'm sorry, her family, her mother and father actually met there, but had to leave Europe also because of racism. And um, she's Jewish and, and had to uh, go there to then also find that, um, you know, she, she's then from a country of racism and now lives in the United States and came here. And of course there's also that, but on the bright side, the baobab tree, which is on the right hand side is um, believed to be from the Venda, um, the Venda people, um, a tree that is actually upside down and um, its roots reach to the heavens. And the analogy is, is that our heads are that the Venda people's heads are that, and that they are inspired um, and look to the heavens for um, uh, for guidance and inspiration and hope. And um, both of these are uh, pieces of mixed media with all kinds of um, images, uh, uh, in there, there's a newspaper uh, in the Venda mother and child. She has got uh, um, telephone book addresses where when apartheid was over, uh, the South Africans were finally using South African or uh, African names and, um, and so on. There's drawing and collage and so on. So, um, and if you have more questions about that, you can ask Jackie when she uh, comes on. Well, we're gonna go next to Monique Barrault, who is actually here in the gallery with me. Um, and she can talk more about this later and you can really hear an eloquent talk about this work uh, if you listen to her um, during the artist talk. but. Briefly, when on the left-hand side, Global was part of the original show. And when she went shopping for the precious stones, what she found is that there's a whole lot of more black stones than there are white stones in the semi-precious stones. And basically the analogy is that there are more globally, the, the uh, amount of population of people of color is by far much more than there are of whites. But yet the white pearl is in the center because the white is the white people are the ones who basically are controlling. And we look, we, we have somehow set up governments and um, societies in which they are the center, they are the pinnacle. And so, um, but, but yet demographically, yes. there's so many more uh, black people um, than there are whites in the world. Yes. The other piece is called black body, object and subject. And this encompasses stones that are also semi-precious that shimmer um, they are, uh, they are truly like in, in, in captured in, in this wire and so on and so forth. And, and I have to say, this is the piece that she did for the show and the wire wraps around the black body as object and subject and Throughout history, black people have been, and people of color have been called out. I mean, they're not usually called out. This is part of what she talks about. Um, they are now being asked in their most, uh, their, their most deepest feelings about what all of this means, what, whether their feelings about uh, what it means to be black in America or throughout the world, uh, what they have gone through, what they're currently going through. And 
although very happy to be able to now have this discourse in the white mainstream, it's also they become the object and subject of, um, of the white mainstream conversation. And I'm going to, I'm going to, if you have more, more questions for her, you can ask her later um, about it. Um, but this is um, there, there being the recognition that the black experience of the curious eyes of the dominant culture watching us in ill informed judgment from afar to being intimately surrounded with a rush of inquiry requesting access to our darkest places. This is a quote from her. Um, and the black body, she says, is exhausted and is laden with a history of being object and subject. Um, and I think that the, the um, analogies are, are to taking a piece of jewelry and creating such an in, intense conversation around them. It is pretty, pretty profound, I think. I think really amazing. Uh, Monique has been making jewelry for a very, very long time. They are all of her own designs and and um, they're always made of precious stones and sterling or gold. Um, anyway, let's move on to the next, which is the work of Garth Trinidad. The piece on the left called The Last Stand was the piece that was part of the show 10 years ago. And uh, that piece, fortunately we found an image of it because he gave it to a friend and then it got lost and then it got and, and uh, unfortunately, it's, it's somewhere in the universe. Um, but Garth did the piece Roos specifically for this show. Um, I am gonna talk a little bit about The Last Stand. Um, I have to say during the art talk, it really struck me very, very emotionally as he did talk about it. The, it is um, the black rhinoceros, which is actually extinct, and, or was becoming extinct 10 years ago. He doesn't know whether it is today or not. Um, but basically the black, he saw black men as the, uh, the black rhinoceros and this having to do so much with self-hate and so much with him, not him, but black men beating up on themselves. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, it really struck a very deep emotional chord in me um, regarding this piece. And again, if you were to listen to him talk about it uh, in the, the art talk, you will get so much more out of it um, than, than just what I am telling you. Um, the, the piece Roos is a combination of many, many um, different things. He's been studying contortion he has, um, it, it, it's a, his own personal reflection on the uh, madness of appearing comfortable while contor contorting and to exist as a black man in America. In, in America. Um, it also goes, he, a, Gar Trinidad of course is a DJ, so he makes a lot of analogy to music. Um, it's also about the improvisation of jazz and how black men have to improvise every single day uh, when they walk out the door um, in order to be able to function in a white society. The colors, of course, represent the American flag and um, the, all the names that you see in the, in the background uh, rep are, are some of the names of the hundred. At the time he was doing research, he found that when he was doing this piece, there had been 164 black people shot by police in the year 2020. And so that is layered with the names of not all of those people, but a lot of those people. Um, it's an acrylic on canvas. Uh, it's 30 by 40, and, um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty profound, profound piece. I mean, this whole show is like really emotionally 
Okay, next. There, there's the other image of um, the rest of the gallery, which is the kitchen area and um, uh, Garth's piece is there. And then we're gonna go to the last slide, which is um, Carla Viparelli. And I bring this, I brought this piece in because it's called transhuman um, because the issue is of course a much more international problem than it existing just in the United States. She did this piece having to do with the people that are leaving Africa and, and uh, throughout North Africa and, and uh, Africa uh, to get away from uh, the horrible injustices that have been going on there and all the boat people that are making it to Italy and, you know, eventually making it into Europe. So this, this, and, you know, it was interesting when I looked up what transhumanance means, it actually refers to livestock. And I, I, Carla was definitely making an analogy because we talked about that, about, you know, like how she happened to use that word to title this piece. Um, when in fact the slaves that were brought over, whether they made it into the Caribbean or they made it into the United States or wherever, and, and even in Europe and so on, were treated like livestock. And, um, and in fact, livestock may have been treated much better, quite frankly, um, <clears throat> because if, as we well know, if they didn't have enough food, they would throw people overboard. So, <clears throat> um, so, I thought it was really relevant to bring in this piece and hang it also in the show, even though Carla is not part of the show that was 10 years ago because she's also confronting the issue, but on an international level. And as I said, it's an international issue. Um, you know, and an international show. I mean, we've got Miles Regis who's from Trinidad. We have Jackie Nash who is from South Africa. And so, um, so it wasn't, it's not just the United States, even though our conversation is really about what's going on here in the United States. Okay, next. So I think we have one more slide that was slide number five. Can you go to that one, Betty? Thank you so much. Okay, so on Tuesday night, we have another art panel discussion. This is Skin Deep Then and Now art activism panel discussion. Now, this is with, um, th it, it, well, Monique is gonna be the moderator. She's a great moderator. I am gonna be part of the panel. I'm gonna talk about the, this show a bit, but then we're gonna move on to Tony Scott, who is an international renowned artist who has shown in Beijing and many, many other places. She is African-American and also American Indian. And so uh, much of her work has to do with, uh, actually almost all of her work has to do with racial issues. Um, and I mean, her work is amazing. If you do not know her, we will be showing her work uh, on, on Tuesday. Um Tuesday, uh, Liz, I just wanted to hop in here real quick because your slide says January 29th. Oh, sorry, it's Tuesday, it does. Tuesday, January 26th. Yes, January 26th. That okay. was a mistake, sorry. No, uh, it's fine. Um, I will post the the meeting mm -hmm. in um, the Key Pie Pie. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. I'll, Thank I'll, you so I'll much get for that taking that. You and get that posted so, <coughs> so everybody can um, tune in if they would like. Right, so, and then, so there's Tony Scott, there is Stan Sanders, who is an art collector and has been um, collecting. He also curated, even though he's not a curator, he's actually a lawyer, but he curated a show here at the, at the Loft at Liz's called uh, Watts. So um, all, the, all the people that were in that, all the works that were in that show had been in some way involved with the Watts Art Center. And so he will be on the panel. And, um, and he is 
still very active in the arts, but not necessarily in this medium of art. So he will be um, bringing his thoughts to, um, to the panel. And then um, also a, a young art critic and columnist for Artillery Magazine, Cole Sweetwood, who is a young, uh, extremely intelligent white guy, a uh, white man who we, um, after having a long discourse with Megan Steinem from Underground, uh, Underground Museum and, um, and talking more among ourselves, really feeling that we needed not only a demographic balance, but we also needed young input because they are the future. They are going to take this issue into you know, the, the next phase of it, that's for sure. And um, I am thrilled that he is gonna be a part of this panel discussion. So if you're interested, uh, we would love for you to join in. Um, hopefully we won't have, we'll be able to figure out the, my computer a little bit easier. <laughs> um, and so with that, um, I think we could open it up to questions. And if anybody has any, or if you want to ask the artists anything, I guess if Liz, yeah. Liz, should I turn off the screen? Sure. So we can see each other. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for any of the artists? Jackie Nash is here, Ted Meyer, Richard Turner, uh, Carla Viparelli, Monique Barol. Well, I have one for you and Monique. When you, when you decided to do this show 10 years later, did you have any expectations of how imagery would change? Um, I did not. I, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know. Um, yeah, I did not. I didn't have any expectation. I just had faith that all of you would be reflect, uh, would reflect on it. And I already knew that you were, I mean, you were chosen for the original show because your mindset, you're already conscious and know that it's an issue. So, um, so, so no, I didn't have any expectation, but I had a, a lot of confidence that you'd all come through and you did. <laughs> There's a question here um, from Michelle. Uh, she's asking Ted, are there meanings behind your color choices in the nine text panels? Well, actually it's hard to see on the photo be to photograph it. The, the whole idea was that it was white type on a white background. I wanted it to be as white as possible. But when I first did it, um, it was a little hard to read the text. So I added some of that opalescent paint over it. So the, the colors actually change as you go by, but I really wanted it to be just as white and nondescript as possible because I just really feel like white people are fading in the background on this issue when they, sh it's, as Liz was saying, like, <coughs> it's, it's our issue more than everybody else's. Right. Um, I do wanna make a comment that, you know, anybody can come to the gallery. We're, the store, my store, uh, Liz's Antique Hardware, is open Monday through Saturday, 10 to six. If you wanna get a bird's eye view of these pieces, you are welcome to come on in. You don't have to make an appointment. I'm up at the front counter at the store. I'm manning the store from 10 to six o'clock, Monday through Friday, and, but it's also open on Saturday. So you are welcome to come on over. Just go up the back stairs, not the one in the alley. That's become a small warehouse, but the rest of it is, you know, it's available through the store. All right, if there aren't any more questions, then uh, I want to thank, oh, Catherine, did you have a question? You're, you're, unmute yourself. 
Somebody, Jody Endicott has a question. Oh, okay. So to all the artists, did you find that either <coughs> of these shows sparked further conversations or actions? I, I, I was curious, Liz, how you found this particular um, group of artists that you selected 10 years ago and now you've included uh, the same artist as well as Carla Viparelli. Um, uh, I, you know how much I run around to all these galleries and studios and everything else. So I knew most of them. Garth was introduced to me uh, by a woman who was working here at the time. She knew Garth. Um, and so that's how I ended up meeting him. Um, and, and I, I think I, you know, Miles came and knocked on my door, um, you know, long before this particular, before this show, it, but I knocked back on his door, um, when, when this show came up and I, I really felt 10 years ago that it was such an important conversation to have and, and, um, but I, I believe I knew Monique for from a personal situation that we ended up meeting and Jackie I knew from the Santa Monica studios and and I chose Jackie um, because Jackie at the time her work she was actually bringing soil back from South Africa so you know, I mean, she was doing the works were done with the soil that she was bring, bringing back. And she had br been raised in the land of apartheid. I mean, um, so, and I wanted to have uh, a balance, you know, of two of everybody, gender and color, you know, and I thought all along here that, you know, somehow I was e evenly balanced all these years until recently when I went, Oh my gosh! I have three men of color and one white. White. So I was under some illusion, but anyway. Um, so there you have it. I was. Um, that's how I met everybody. It was. And I'm going to go back to uh, Jody Endicott's question. That is uh, to all the artists. Um, did you find that either of these shows sparked further conversation or actions? Well, there's yeah. so much to say that the, the conversation never really ends. Mm -hmm. It doesn't begin or it doesn't end. It's just there. It's constantly there in the background or up front as in this show. But it, it didn't make any difference to me uh, because it's always been there. I think that uh, if I might jump in, um, you know, artists have to work from their truth. Otherwise, we're just making product. And Richard actually just said exactly what I was going to say, uh, even though my work that I did 30 years ago is quite different to the stuff today, but there really is a thread that one can see as I've evolved and embraced different situations in the world, different peoples, I've encountered different experiences, but all of it is very much from my perception of reality. And it comes from our, you know, what makes that particular individual? It's your, I think your historical, genetic, geographic coincidence of how you are at this moment and why I am different to someone else. My perception of reality reflects in my work. And if I don't work from that truth, then I kind of feel cheap, you know, in, it, it's, it's commercial. I, you know, it's easy to make pretty paintings, but to make something with a content that really has conversation, has thinking, um, is exciting to me to have that kind of uh, output and to have that kind of experience with the viewer. That's always fabulous to hear, you know, different viewers comment on things. It's so subjective. 
that it's it's sort of it magnifies the reality of of how we fear the unknown and the unknown could just be someone who looks foreign to us so i i i think i was raised i i, I come from a long line of discrimination experiences and uh, even before I was born, before my parents were born, the world has been spinning around that same yeah. light bulb, you know, time to change the light bulb. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. yeah. I think oh. Okay, am I... No, I've got to... I've got to come over. Hold on one second. Monique is coming over to this computer and muting hers. So I'm going to step away, okay? Because we're doing the, the math thing. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, the question is, is what, uh, if doing this work provoked something new for me? So I'll say that um, uh, uh, I, uh, in the first show, um, I had started showing jewelry with Liz kind of as the early, early days of the gallery. I had never done work on this topic before. Uh, Liz asked me, she called and said, do you think you can do work for this topic? And I'm like, wow, I really don't know. <laughs> Let me think about it. And so I, um, I actually went uh, down to the jewelry. She talked about my experience looking for stones. I, I just went to the, to the jewelry area to this place where I buy stones and ju and stuff and, uh, and and that's when it started to emerge for me that this was a topic because I started to see as she talked about this weird analogy about the stones and I equated that to the world you know white and non-white yet there's so much white culture dominance in a world that is primarily not white and those included in the not white group uh, are various shades of color, but they're not white. So that's when that began. But after the show, we were in the Obama era. So, you know, it was sort of like, ah, oh, we've arrived, the world, we've come forward. This is, we're finally shaking this ugly past and people understand that skin color isn't, a, 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 isn't, the end all of, of the discourse, you know, I was very naive, very, very naive. Um, and for me, uh, things dramatically changed really uh, in the last few years with these increasing uh, availability of video of the black lynchings at the hands of the police, uh, mm -hmm. the murders, senseless murders. And I, for the first time in my life, uh, at a, at a, at, in recent years, started to think when, when driving, shit, there's a police officer, I better behave because I could fucking die. And I grew up without that feeling and identity. So that's new to me. So when this, sh when, when we decided to do the show again and I had to make a piece again, it, it, it really, I, I was talking about several different pieces for these feelings. And then this piece really just took me over with, with the I can't breathe and and then attending and the uprising, uh, the marches, and uh, I attended a number of uh, Zooms on racial mm -hmm. equity and justice mm -hmm. in higher education, where I heard so many people, especially white people saying that they realize they don't know and they don't understand what the black experience is. And that's where this piece started to emerge from, where people in these Zooms the Zoom rooms, which would, which would be a big group with a lecture and a panel of professionals, and then we would break into breakout groups, and people, you know, were instructed. It's a safe space. Say whatever you need, and and I realized that I began to wonder: Do they understand what they're asking? I don't think they understand. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the uh, the artist talk, I, I equate it kind of to a rape. I mean, when you know a woman's been raped, you don't usually ask her what that was like. And I don't think people understand the depth of pain and 
Now, the depth of inquiry to what it what the black experience is, and for me, it's been good. Okay, so for people for whom it's been much more difficult, it, it's deep, mm-hmm. and so that's really where the piece came from. That it's just the focus can be exhausting. First, we're focused on because people wonder, you know, oh, she's black. Is she really going to be competent? Or they say, oh, he's black. Oh, he's so articulate. Like it's a surprise, you know, <laughs> it's just like, it's not really something, you know? I mean, I laugh because it's just like, to me, I'm like, are you kidding? Uh, but anyway, so now in the last few years and now as co-curator, I've done a lot of research on the topic so that we can be conversant to prepare for the panel and, uh, and, and, and it's a much bigger topic in my life in general. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> can, can I add one thing? That was a great, great answer. Well, what, what the topic, what this thing, this racism thing does is steals from me the ability to gauge in art for art's sake. Right, right. And that really grinds my ass because it's it, it, it's it's a part of art that this thing blocks mm-hmm. it's the same thing for women too yeah um, you know and i have to i actually lived in a in a ghetto in portland i was raised in portland and it was a time where we you know it was like you didn't address anyone's culture um, you didn't define someone by their culture. It was that everybody's the same. And then I moved to, uh, you know, but that didn't feel right either because we didn't celebrate culture, different people's culture, understanding, you know, what their stories were and what their history was. And um, so I, I had one black fellow going to my high school who was bussed in. I was bussed from the ghetto to my mother's white rich neighborhood and for about six months and that was a that was a completely juxtaposition and so then I moved to Hawaii because I wanted to acknowledge culture I my grandfather won't even talk about what he he was what his childhood was like he was Polish and um so I I come to Hawaii, I go to art school. I was pregnant and had two sons, two white sons in art school uh, when I was getting my master's and my BFA. And um, I realized that, you know, it was so important for me to um, raise these boys as accepting of, of culture. And in fact, one of them, their preschool here they only accepted just a few white boys, white, you know, white kids, and everyone else had to be from the rest of the world. So it was, it's Hawaii is different. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I, I'm doing a good job. My son once asked me if he was white. And I thought, well, then I, then I, you know, I've accomplished what I wanted. I wanted him not to look at people differently. And then I realized we, you know, it's, it's confusing because if we, if we don't acknowledge or don't have this conversation, then we're negating so much. And I realized that, you know, when here I am a mother of these, of these boys, and then George Floyd calls out for his mother. And it, it's like, wow, our stories are so similar, but so not. Oh, and no. that's why I asked the, the question. It, can, can I contribute something? So, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's, when we talk about celebrating culture, uh, acknowledging culture, there are aspects of culture that um, I, I love also multiple cultures. I, I'm a world mm-hmm. traveler and I love languages and I learn them as a hobby whenever I go anywhere from China to Japan to wherever it is, I always learn something and everyone thinks I can do it because I, I just, I'm lucky that way, I'm gifted that way. But, um, but then there's also something about called hi- the history, the right. cultural history mm-hmm. and, and celebrating, I don't know that that's really the right word, 
So there's the cultural history that creates scars and trauma. And, and there are also scars and trauma, the scars and trauma for absolutely everybody on every side of it. Mm -hmm. So there's the scars and the trauma for those that were victimized uh, like slaves and, and, and descendants of slaves for many years. And there's the scars and the trauma for the slave owners. It's not acknowledged very much. Mm. And what is the epigenetics of it? Meaning, how does that trickle down over time? And just like uh, Richard said just a moment ago, he can't get away from his blackness when he walks into a gallery or, 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 or someone may see the work. And then when they see him, they don't just see an artist. They see a black man first in America. That's how that is. Mm -hmm. um, as a white person, you could have grown up in the worst ghetto of the world. And I don't, it's not about you personally. No, you fine. could have been, uh, you could be a, a man, a white man who we all think is, is, has the, all the virtues of whatever. Uh, you may have been raped. You may have been gang raped by boy, other boys when you were a, a young man. Uh, you could have had a whole bunch of trauma shit happen to you. Right. And if you're an artist, when, you, when, when people see you, they say, oh, there's an artist period. Mm -hmm. Not a black artist, not a Chicano artist, not a woman artist, not a, but, but black and white and is, it has, it carries special challenges, the black topic. And that's why we have the show about black and white, because the reality is different from Chicano descendants who come here, our Latinx brothers and sisters, people who maybe grew up in Mexico where they all looked the same and it was a class issue, but it wasn't the color of your skin issue. Hmm. It, it, and that one just carries some special weight, I think. So we all have trauma. And I think in that we have to all, to get past it, which is what this show is about. It's like, where do right. we go from here? Mm -hmm. I think we have to all really truly look at each other as all of us damaged by this horrible history. And, and be open and be willing to navigate this difficult territory, trying to put judgment aside, judgment's natural, but we have to try when it pops up, we have to say, oh, there's judgment that society put on me, but I don't have to enact it. I don't have to live that. You know, it's, it's, we have to all be willing to take it on. It's a job, it's extra, it's work. But we hope that the art here tells a story that make people who maybe don't know that story wake up and say, oh, like, I'm so jealous. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know? that, that's really, uh, you know, celebrate was, I, I'm sorry, I, it, that was the wrong word to use. Um, the denial of the history and, and when we, I guess when I say, you know, I woke up to that denying of that trauma that you're talking about. So I, your work, everyone's work in this show, you know, expanded that for me. And I hope that this, this video really um, is used for further conversation and explanation. It'll get people thinking beyond the artworks. I mean, the artworks are it tells so much of a story and yeah, yeah. well and I'm and everything all wrong and I'm, I'm I apologize for that no 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 not, not, at, all, not at all I'm uh -huh. so thrilled that you you speak up and you talk about it it's absolutely it, that's that's yeah she Monique's thanks you we just can't be like right next to each other but she thanks you and and if anybody's interested in getting the link um, I'll send you the January newsletter from the loft at Liz's and there you have the link to uh, the art talk that we had, which mm -hmm. believe me, these people are way more articulate than I am about their work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really, like I said, really some profound stuff. I mean, I was emotional, very emotional. Liz, I wanted to um, give Carla a chance to speak because she wanted to talk real quickly and then we kind of end it, end it on that. Um, sure. Um, can I just say one thing that if you want to do that, send an email to me, Liz at the loft at Liz's .com, And I will 
forward on to the newsletter. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Um, first, I would like to say something about the jewel Leo Monique. As soon as I saw her work, uh, the stones um, remind me to the connection between stones and racism. Uh, I mean that just in this day, uh, these days before the 27th of January, which is the Memorial Day for the uh, persecution of Jewish people in Italy, uh, <clears throat> they add some uh, stumbling stones uh, near the area uh, of the Jewish quarter. So maybe because the memory of these, uh, of every racist issue uh, is uh, heavy as a stone. So they put every year, they add some uh, stumbling stones on that area, uh, 20 or, <laughs> or 10. So this idea of stones and memory uh, make me gallop <laughs> with my, uh, and I found it really touching. And second thing, I just, uh, uh, let me say thank you so much, Leeds. I am uh, absolutely thrilled to be here just in this period, which uh, I miss uh, Los Angeles, I miss you all, my dear friends, Leeds, Andy, Catherine. And uh, for me, uh, it's really, this really means a lot. It's a travel through space and also as the exhibition is 10 years ago through time, so thank you, thank you, Liz, so much. You are the best friend ever. <laughs> Bye, <Thank> everybody. <laughs> we all adore you and miss you and can't wait till you come back. <laughs> Carla, be up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning in <laughs> So, bravo. Thank you for making the effort to be here tonight. Absolutely. Liz, I want to thank you and all of the artists that are in this exhibition for being our guest tonight on Keep Hi Fi Happy Hour. This was a fabulous talk. I wish we could continue it and make it longer, but I hope everyone will tune in to the artist talk on Tuesday um, at Loft at Liz's and uh, hear the continuation and the um, articulate comments and uh, and, and just kind of feelings about what's happening um, with the panel and all of the artists. Thank you again very much. We appreciate you all being here and I'm gonna say good night. Thank you so much, Andy, Betty, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. It's a wonderful- Good night, day. everyone. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.